Good morning. This is another Bio 109 virtual field trip. And this morning we're going to be meeting a Gila monster. And Tom McDonald is going to be speaking about it. Some of you may know Tom because he teaches physiology at Pima West. Um, so without uh, additional detail, we will uh, start right in. Okay. So we've got a Gila monster today. Let's uh, pick you up. Let's see if people see you a little closer here. So Gila monster is one of the iconic creatures of the American Southwest. Um, he is found only um, here in the United States and down into Sonora, Mexico. Um, Gila monster is one of only two venomous uh, lizards in, North, in the Western Hemisphere. He has a Mexican cousin, don't we all, um, called the Mexican beaded lizard that uh, lives down in Sonora and its range extends all the way down to Guatemala. But uh, Gila monster is, uh, by the way, I should mention this, Gila monster is protected by law everywhere in the United States and Mexico. It's illegal to remove them from captivity. So I know it looks cool to have one, but uh, you need to leave them out in the desert. These guys are very vulnerable, they're slow moving, they get hit by cars all the time, there aren't that many to begin with. So it's not one of these stupid laws that's taking your freedoms away. It's a law designed to make sure that our children and their children and their children will still get to see Gila monsters, that they won't disappear from the planet anytime soon. So um, notice the, the coloration. These guys are black background and then they have patterns on them that are usually in the pink, orange, yellow palette. I don't know, it might be sort of, a, I watch a show called Project Runway with my wife, I've been trying to learn color names like mauve and teal and puce and periwinkle. I think maybe it's kind of a peach, I don't know, um, I might be wrong on that. But um, Gila monster, uh, interesting in terms of its, uh, its name, um, its scientific name is Heloderma suspectum. Heloderma is interesting. Helo means stud. Uh, not stud like me, uh, but stud like a nail or like uh, the rivets on your jeans. And so uh, then derm means uh, skin, like a dermatologist. So Heloderma literally means studded skin. Okay, so the Gila monster has, um, you can see in the skin, all these little bumps. Um, so the little bumps are actually little chunks of bone. They're called osteoderms. So the osteoderms are bones that are embedded in the skin, or as Barbara has on the skull, they're actually fused with the skull itself. So the skull, uh, as fused in the skin, they're just all throughout. Um, uh, the purpose of the osteoderms is not known for sure. Um, part of it may be thermal regulation. The Gila monster is out during very hot times of the year. So they may help absorb heat so that it doesn't end up frying its internal organs. And also it may be to um, deter predation, that a predator might have trouble biting down through the osteoderms. So Heloderma suspectum, again, is his name, Heloderma, because he has studded skin. That's his scientific name. Um, Heloderma suspectum is interesting, the, the suspectum part, because it was actually a paleontologist who was here in Arizona in the late 1800s. Um, a lot of the viewers may know Arizona didn't become part of the United States until after the Mexican-American War, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo in 1848, and the Gaston Purchase in 1854. So a lot of scientists didn't come to this area until the late 1800s, and when they came, um, oftentimes they were just making notes of everything they could find. So even though um, E.D. Cope was a paleontologist, he was looking at the plants and the animals and so on. And when he first came across a Gila monster, the Native Americans here said that the Gila monster had a horribly painful bite. And so he suspected that it might be venomous, but he didn't know, so he called it Heloderma suspectum, because it was suspected to be venomous. Now I mentioned before the uh, Gila monster has a a Mexican cousin, like a lot of us do, um, called the beaded lizard, the Mexican beaded lizard, and its scientific name is Heloderma horridum. So this guy is the suspect, and the Mexican beaded lizard is the horrid one. 
like the little girl who, when she was good, she was very, very good. When she was bad, she was horrid. So um, not you, of course, Barbara. Of course. But, um, so uh, Gila Monster, uh, <clears throat> again, spectacular colors. Um, let me point out again that it is illegal anywhere in the United States or Mexico to capture these guys. To even harass them, you shouldn't uh, be doing that. This is a Gila Monster skull. This is a real one that Tom brought along with him. And you can see the uh, bony structures that he mentioned when he was showing us the live animal. A couple of things to note about this. Um, one is he's got a fantastic array of teeth. Um, so a bite is a bite. Um, he's also got a really broad head. And in a lot of animals, what this means, and this is true for this creature, that there are some massive jaw muscles that give this animal a strong bite on top of everything else. The venom, unlike on a rattlesnake, originates from glands in the lower jaw, not the upper jaw. Uh, so it's a slightly different delivery system uh, uh, that these animals use. They also have a pretty good sense of smell, so if you look right down at his nose, um, you can see that he's got some big nasal openings, not so large an opening for the eyes, so perhaps those are important, but not so much so as with scent. So, Tom, is this a big one, or is this about average? Yeah, this is actually, oh, you saw that reaction right there. Um, Gila monsters are slow, but they can turn their heads very rapidly. So this guy is actually a big Gila monster. He's about as big as they get. The largest Gila monster recorded was 22 inches snout to vent, is the way they measure it. Snout means the tip of the nose, and vent, they go back to the cloaca. The cloaca is the single opening for both eliminating waste and for reproduction. So they measure it that way because a lot of lizards, as you may know if you've ever caught a lizard, sometimes their tails break off. And the tail wiggles around and thrashes on the ground. So that's why as the standard measure, you never include the length of the tail when you talk about lizard length. So snout to vent, the largest one of these guys ever was 22 inches. This guy's about 18, so he's very big. He weighs over a kilogram, which is uh, big by, by Gila Monster standards. So the vet that I take him to has been in practice since the 1970s, and he says this is one of the biggest he's ever seen. The Mexican beaded lizard, his cousin, can get up to 36 inches, so it's a it's a whole size bigger. Do you know how old this guy is? I do because he was born in captivity. This guy is 30 years old, um, which is very old for a heel monster. That's really the uh, near the upper bound of their age. I think the maximum age ever recorded, one lived to be 45. But at 30 years old, this guy is really quite old. So, and he's doing great. He's really healthy. He just went to his vet appointment today and the vet says he is looking great. Do they keep growing throughout their lives? They do. Um, they start off small. They hatch from eggs. And so they grow up to their maximum length. So mm -hmm. he's, he's at 30 years old. I don't think he's going to get much bigger than this. Mm -hmm. okay. So tell me exactly how venomous are these guys? Yeah, great question. So these guys, as you mentioned earlier, Unlike snakes who have their venom glands in the upper jaw, they have their venom glands in the lower jaw. And that's not a very efficient way to inject venom. So as a result, when they bite, they have those powerful jaw muscles you mentioned, and they really hang on because it takes a while for the venom to seep upwards by capillary action into the bite. Now their venom for humans has really only two major effects. One is excruciating pain, and people say that it is the most, people who have been bitten, I haven't, say that it's the most painful thing they've ever experienced. They also cause hypotension, they cause a loss of blood pressure. So, one of the things I read a, an account in a medical journal of a guy who was bitten by one, and he wanted to drive himself to the hospital and passed out from low blood pressure on the way to the hospital. Mm -hmm. So, if you get bitten, have somebody else drive you to the hospital, okay, or mm -hmm. dial 911. But the venom is not uh, really fatal to humans, very painful, causes the drop in blood pressure. The last recorded death from a Gila monster that we know of was in 1930, and it was a guy named Tom Reap in Casa Grande, Arizona, who ran a pool hall. And somebody brought one in, 
And they said, don't worry, it can't hurt you. And it bit him, and then they used pliers to get it off, and he died two hours later. Now, I would imagine that he had some kind of serious pre-existing health condition, and that's why he died. A normal, healthy person will never die from a heel monster bite. Is there interest in this venom as a, uh, a possible uh, blood pressure control medication? There is. There is interest in it as a blood pressure mechanism. Um, to date, the one drug that has been developed, you can see how quick they are to respond. Yeah. Uh, people think they're slow, but they can turn very rapidly. Um, back in the 1990s, an endocrinologist by the name of John Eng, um, who was doing diabetes research, and he noticed that the Gila monster has a compound in its venom called Exendin-4. And Exendin-4 is very similar to what we humans have, the glucagon-like peptide 1, which is one of a class of hormones called secretins. They cause you to secrete more insulin. So John Eng discovered that the Exendin-4 in Gila monster uh, saliva actually stayed active much longer than GLP-1 did in humans. So it also, um, in addition to causing the secretion of insulin, it delayed gastric emptying, so the stomach stayed full longer, and it also decreased appetite in the brain. So he went to work and developed a drug called Exemetide, sold under the name Bietta, which is now used to treat type 2 diabetics. And the researchers called the drug lizard spit, because it came from the saliva of a Gila monster. Yeah. Well, you know, nature is uh, the best chemists on the planet. Uh, creatures like this come up with amazing survival mechanisms that sometimes have impacts uh, for us. So if I were to get bitten, what should I do? I would say, uh, I would recommend write your will in the sand. <laughs> That's probably the best thing to do. Okay. Um, again, their, their bite is not fatal. Um, what you would want to do, um, the first thing, is to try to get them to stop biting you. Again, they have those powerful pit bull-like jaws, almost crocodilian. Um, and so uh, usually what they recommend is to take something like a screwdriver, which I had one somewhere, oh, there it is right there, and try to pry their jaws open in order to get it to release. Um, please be gentle when you do that, because if you get bitten by a heel monster, it's your fault. They can't run you down and overtake you. Um, it means you were screwing with it, and, um, and it's your fault that you got bitten. So try to uh, pry the jaws open. There are some other goofy things I've heard people say. One that's really funny is they say, just put its head under water, and that'll make it let go. Well, reptiles, because their ectotherms have a very low demand for oxygen, so this guy at home, I have a big dog water dish in his enclosure, and he often crawls in there and sleeps with his head under water for an hour at a time. So if you think you're going to immerse it to let it, get it let go, it might, but be prepared to wait up to an hour uh, before it will actually let go, and I'm not sure you're going to be able to tolerate the pain that long. Yeah. yeah. So the best treatment is precaution. Just behave yourself and be polite around the Gila monster. Makes sense to me. By the way, the osteoderms we've talked about before are found not only in Gila monsters, they're found in armadillos and also in crocodilians. Hmm. Great examples of convergent evolution, yeah. where you've got a defense mechanism that has been replicated several times. That is cool. That is cool. But what do these guys eat? They're so slow. I know. Isn't that something? Yeah, it's not like they can run down their prey. Um, and they can really only eat things that can't fight back. So they eat helpless things. They eat eggs a lot. Quail eggs, dove eggs, lizard and snake eggs. They'll also eat newborn mice, newborn rabbits, little baby birds that have fallen out of the nest. People say, oh, the little baby bird. Well, everybody has to eat. Yep. That's the way nature works. Right. So, yeah, they have a, you can see it's flicking its tongue out all the yeah. time. And it's got a forked tongue. So a lot of reptiles, and even some mammals, have what's called a vomeronasal organ, a Jacobson's organ, up in the roof of the mouth. So it sticks the tongue out, and then it touches the tongue to that organ, and that tells it what it's smelling. And the tongue is forked because, for the same reason, we have two ears. 
you can tell where a sound is coming from because it strikes your ears at different times. So the same thing with the forked tongue, it can tell where the smell is coming from. And so therefore it can track down where the prey is. So after they've eaten their meal, which again, they eat helpless things that can't fight back and can't run away, they, uh, Gila monsters spend, by the way, roughly 90, more than 90% of their lives underground in burrows. They can either dig their burrows, they have powerful legs and long nails, or they'll modify another animal's burrow. But they spend roughly 90% or more of their lives underground. They may only come out four or five times a year to find a mate and to find food. So as a result, um, they have to, they eat so infrequently, they have to be able to store the food as energy. And that's what Gila monsters do in their tail. So that big fat tail is actually fat. That's where it's stored energy. And it can live off of that for months at a time. Sometimes when I see Gila monsters out in the desert, I take a look at their tail. It has a skinny little tail. That means it's not doing very well. A big fat tail like this guy, because he lives in captivity. This guy gets steak for dinner you know, every, every week. So he's doing just great. But yeah, the tail is the way they store energy for later, and that's also why they have that great enzyme, exendin-4, to help control their blood sugar when they don't eat very often. Hmm. So these guys essentially are adapted to eat only a couple of times a year, real big meals, uh, and then take a long breather. Uh, that's right. And hang out. Very different from a mammal that's got to eat. Very, very, very different. Yeah, wow. for sure. Different way of living. Okay, so um, we know what these guys eat. Does anybody eat them? Yeah, great question. So um, when these guys are small, they hatch from eggs. So when they're first born, they're only a couple inches long. And lots of things will go after them then. Um, birds of prey, road runners, you know, hawks, owls, road runners. Um, snakes will eat them. Um, you know, even coyotes and bobcats and things will make little bite-sized meals of them. Once they get to be this size, nobody messes with them very much. It's kind of like the old joke, you know, where does a 500-pound gorilla sleep mm -hmm. any place it wants to? Nobody messes when they're this big. You know, as, as we know, predators, you know, it's risky if you're a predator. You don't want to get injured when you're getting your food. Sure. So most predators, when they see something this big that hisses at you and turns its head that fast, they think twice and try to find an easier meal. Yeah, makes sense. So uh, look at how he gapes his mouth when you uh, irritate him. Um, that's a fearsome display. Um, that in itself is designed to get other animals to back off and leave him alone. So, so what time of year do these animals mate? Yeah, that's an interesting question. So, like I said, they really only come out of their burrows four or five times a year, usually just to find food and for mating. Now, for many years, the sources said that they made it in the spring. But I just found out today, talking to the vet, that recent research has shown that, in fact, they probably mate in the fall after the monsoon season. Um, they normally will, the females will produce maybe around a half a dozen eggs. That would be typical. But the eggs take 10 months to a year to gestate. Mm. So that means that basically then the newborns are come about in the late spring, early summer. Uh -huh. um, so yeah, that's um, the mating is something that, again, these guys spend so much time underground that it's very difficult to study them and not a lot is known about them. So just recently they discovered that in fact, they more likely mate in the fall, not in the spring like had been previously thought. Mm -hmm. Can females store sperm like other reptiles, some other reptiles can do? I'm not sure about that. Uh -huh. um, you know, the rattlesnake females do that. I'm not sure if the Gila monster females do that or not. And I'm not sure anybody knows. Again, these animals are so difficult to study yeah. that, I mean, look, they're, they're mating season. They didn't even have right for a long time. They're only recently getting that figured out. So do male Gila monsters have to uh, hunt for females the way Mantarantulas do? Yeah. yeah, that's an interesting question. So, as it turns out, um, as I mentioned before, they may only come out three or four or five times a year, either to get food or to find a mate. And um, the males do compete for the female. 
I just learned today from the vet that some of the recent research is showing that sometimes males and females will come together, split up, and then the same male and female will come back together again. So there's almost like sort of a pair bond in a sense. But the males will fight with one another for the female. One thing, I went to a presentation one time about Gila monsters, and they said that one of the things the males may do is bite each other's toes off. And I heard that, and sure enough, it was just that same year I encountered a couple of heel monsters in the wild, and each one had toes bitten off. So apparently the males get pretty fierce in their competition for the ladies. Uh -huh. Okay, so some reptiles have hemipenes, um, which is a, a forked penis instead of a single device. Uh, do these guys have that sort of apparatus? They do. Um, yeah, a lot of the reptiles have the hemipenes, like the snakes do as well. So hemipene, literally half penis. Um, so when they copulate with the female, they use one of the two hemipenes. Now, I don't know if they have a hand in this like humans do. I don't know if they always use the same one or if they switch off. I don't really know the answer to that. But that is the way they copulate. Um, mating can take as little as five minutes or may take as much as two hours. So I guess just like a lot of guys, some of them finish soon and some of them take a little longer. So once mating is concluded, about how many eggs can a female lay? Typical would be around a half a dozen. I hear anywhere from like maybe two up to a dozen, but I think the typical number is half a dozen. Again, gestation is about 10 months, so they mate in the late summer or fall, and then the babies are born sometime in the following spring. So the eggs overwinter and then hatch? Okay. Apparently so. So it sounds like what they're doing is they're timing both reproduction and hatching to avoid the least productive parts of the year, the blazing summer. And also with the abundance of food. So yeah. late summer, the monsoon season, you have an abundance of food, so that's a good time. And then in the spring, there's the abundance of food again, so it's perfect timing. You know, mate when there's an abundance of food, have the eggs hatch when there's abundance of food as well. Makes sense. So, Tom, a few more questions from what I guess is our studio audience. <laughs> um, one of them is, what do they do uh, when they're underground for all those months? Uh, what do they do? Seriously. They spend 90 plus percent of their lives in their burrows. Nobody has any idea. Drink margaritas and watch Netflix. Nobody knows. Um, and in, in captivity, I have a big hiding place for him in his enclosure, and he spends 90 percent of his life in that hiding place. He just doesn't come out. He just hangs out in there. It makes sense to do that for a lot of animals, especially predators. Because every time a predator goes hunting, it can get hurt, somebody else eats it, or maybe its prey fights back, doesn't happen too much for these guys. But what that means is predation is a risk. So if you can go down into your burrow and stretch out the time between the next necessary meal, it's a good survival mechanism. And of course, again, they only eat a few times a year, so it conserves energy as well. Yeah. yeah so you are a slick, slick operation. Okay, next question is, um, where do females lay eggs? So females lay eggs, like a lot of reptiles do, snakes and most lizards, they basically scoop out a little pit in the sand, lay the eggs, and cover them up with sand uh -huh. to try to keep predators from getting them and also to kind of thermoregulate as well so they don't bake in the sun and so on. And so. Is there, and this is true for turtles, with some turtles, uh, sex determination is temperature based. So a cooler temperature results in one an individual developing as one sex, a warmer temperature means the animal in that egg develops into the other sex. Is that the case for Gila monsters? Is there any temperature? Yeah, you know, that's true for several reptiles. I don't know if that's true for Gila monsters or not. Okay. I'm just not sure if that is or not. Another big question yeah. uh, that uh, we have not yet figured out. Not me, anyway. Yeah, okay. So, uh, once the eggs hatch, uh, do the parents provide any parental care? No, there's no parental care, really. Most uh, reptiles are like that. You know, 
know, mom lays the eggs, takes off, never sees the kids. Rattlesnakes are an interesting exception. Rattlesnake moms will normally stay with the, the newborn until they uh, shed for the first time. Um, so that's kind of an unusual situation. Most reptiles, uh, the parents never see the kids. And so once these little guys are on their own, uh, what's, do you have any sense of what the survival rate might be? I don't. I don't have any idea of that. And once again, it's so hard to, uh, um, a lot, of, a lot of, in many cases, they don't even know where these guys live. They've only found a couple of dens, um, so um, again, so much about these guys is unknown because they're not a common animal. They're relatively scarce, um, a sparse population to begin with, and it's so difficult to study them uh, because they don't come out into the open very often. Do you know about how big a newly hatched Gila monster is? A few inches. A few inches. So maybe Sometimes the size of my finger. Uh, something like that. Sometimes uh, people will mistake our little western banded gecko for uh, baby heel monsters. So baby heel monsters can be quite small, just a few inches, length of your finger, something like that. But they're always this color as soon as they're, they're always this color. They're, when they're born, they have the normal coloration pattern, which isn't that gorgeous. And I've seen a lot of Native American art with patterns like this, and I, would, I can't imagine that they didn't borrow from here. Why not? It's just the, the pattern is absolutely spectacular. Just look at what a beautiful animal that is. Yeah, they really are. It's a real privilege to see them in the wild. I'm it sure is. get lucky, but it is a privilege. So Tom, are the newly hatched babies venomous too? They are. Most venomous animals are venomous from the time they're born. You know, that's true the same with rattlesnakes, for example. The newly born rattlesnakes can envenomate you. Same is true for the Gila monsters. It doesn't take time for the venom to develop. So, uh, I presume since they're reptiles, these animals shed. Is that the case? You betcha. I mean, we humans shed, too, constantly from our epidermis. But, interestingly, reptiles shed. All reptiles do. Turtles do. Crocodiles do. Everybody. Lizards and snakes do it in a very different way. You may have seen a whole shed snake skin. That's often how you tell if you've got a snake around your yard. So, snakes tend to shed their entire skin at once. Lizards shed little bits at a time. So, on its back legs, yeah. you can see there are pieces of their chunks of skin that are coming off right now. It basically just peeled off that mm -hmm. piece of skin. So he's constantly shedding. Little chunks of skin are constantly falling off uh -huh. the entire time. Okay. So Barbara, are you? Uh, have you ever uh, touched a Gila monster before? I have that's, never touched a Gila monster. That's kind of a bucket list experience. If you, have yeah. you ever scratched the belly of a Gila monster? Not. This might be your, your big opportunity. And I'm not inclined to touch a Gila monster <laughs> unless it's being held by somebody I trust. But he's not slimy. Uh, it feels like some kind of smooth, uh, uh, expensive plastic or beautifully beaded uh, uh, bracelet or something like that. And you can see he's nice and healthy, nice, pretty shine. I was going to say over on the side, you can feel those osteoderms, oh, those yeah. bumps. Yeah, he's flatter on his stomach than yeah. he is on uh, his back, which is more round bumps. Mm -hmm. round bumps. Really, really cool animal. Okay, so this concludes our visit with uh, Tom and the Gila monster. This animal is essentially unique to the Southwest. Uh, it's unlike any other uh, animal globally. Uh, we really are privileged to get a great look at this animal and learn so much about it and learn that uh, there are many things yet to be learned about this creature. Um, I want to thank Tom for bringing this animal in. Um, one thing Tom didn't mention is that he has a permit to retain this animal and he can only retain it if he's using it for educational purposes. So it's not a living room ornament for him. Um, I also want to thank uh, Liz and uh, Jill and Angie uh, of our film crew and uh, whomever ends up editing this segment. It's been enormously uh, helpful. Um, but back to our guy. He's just as cool as he can be. And uh, we're glad to have a chance to see him today. Wave goodbye. Bye. <laughs> Wave goodbye.
stick your tongue out.